All right. Well, welcome to all family, students, classroom, science lovers who are joining us virtually to take part in this special event to officially launch Science Literacy Week. My name is Joe Gorowski, and I work with Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants. Uh, for those who might be new to our program, we're all about bringing science, adventure, exploration, and conservation live into classrooms across North America. So on any given month, we're doing 30, 40, even 50 live events connecting students with scientists, explorers from all over the world for guest speakers and virtual field trips. If you want to dive in and check out a little bit more, check out exploringbytheseat.com. You can find all the exciting events that we do have coming up. All right. So today we celebrate the launch of Science Literacy Week. Science Literacy Week showcases the many ways we can explore and enjoy the diversity of Canadian science. From September 21st to the 27th, 2020, libraries, museums, science centers, schools, and not-for-profits are coming together to celebrate this year's theme, which is biodiversity. Canada is a country rich in biodiversity from lakes to oceans, prairies to boreal forests, marshland to tundra. Our country is brimming with science. Joining us today to explore this amazing biodiversity that surrounds us is biodiversity expert, Dr. Mark Johnson and his daughter, May. So I'm gonna pop them in just for a second here to, for a little wave. Hey, Mark, hey, May, how are you doing today? Hello. Fantastic, how are you? Excellent, well, we're gonna bring you back in shortly. Um, before we do though, uh, we have some distinguished guests joining us today and they've got a special message for us. So I'm pleased to introduce our Minister of Innovation, Science and Industry, the Honorable Navdeep Baines, and then Professor Alejandro Adam, President of the Natural Sciences and Engineering Research Council of Canada. Hello everyone, on behalf of the Government of Canada, I want to wish all Canadians a happy Science Literacy Week. The past several months have demonstrated the important role that science plays in our society. And as we work to address COVID-19, scientists and researchers will continue to lead our country's efforts. As a proud community partner, the government has invested in science from day one. We're making these significant investments because we know the great science is the starting point for innovation. Research leads to discoveries. Discoveries lead to ideas. And entrepreneurs then take those ideas to market and create jobs while in a stronger Canadian economy. So I invite you to get involved, join the conversation, and share your love of science. Thank you. Hello, my name is Alejandro Adam, and I am president of the Natural Sciences and Engineering Research Council of Canada, inviting you to take part in Science Literacy Week. As a scientist myself, I know firsthand the tremendous joy of discovery and learning about science. La semaine de la culture scientifique met in valeur le travail des rédacteurs, d'artistes, des cinéastes et des communicateurs qui nous parlent des incroyables découvertes faites par des scientifiques et des ingénieurs canadiens. This September, libraries, museums, science centers, schools, and not-for-profits across Canada are celebrating this year's Science Literacy Week theme, Biodiversity. Ces promoteurs de la culture mettent en vitrine des livres, des films, des balados, et des activités qui explorent les faits scientifiques sur l'incroyable variété de plantes, d'animaux, d'organismes et d'écosystèmes qui constituent la vie sur la Terre. We are also sharing stories, interviews, and documentaries about all kinds of other great scientific discoveries having to do with medicine, outer space, computers, and more. Il est facile de participer à la Semaine de la Culture Scientifique. Visit our website at www.scienceliteracy.ca to learn more about what's happening during the week. Découvrez l'estime par la lecture au cours de la Journée nationale Je lis la science, le 23 septembre. Visit your local library. Stream a nature documentary at home. Or listen to a podcast interview with a scientist working at the cutting edge of their field. Science Literacy Week is about helping us all appreciate the stories 
about the science, discoveries, and ingenuity shaping our lives. Science Literacy Week runs from September 21st to 27th, 2020. Soyez de notre. All right. Well, fantastic. Thank you, Professor Adam and Minister Baines. I think we can now say that Science Literacy Week is officially kicked off. Now, before we speak with Mark and May, there's a couple things I'd like to do. The first is a big shout out to everybody who's starting to tune in live via Facebook and YouTube. So I see the numbers climbing. I can see the classrooms out there. So use that comment section. Uh, let us know where you're tuning in from. We'll do a few shout outs. And of course, uh, as the presentation goes on today, send us in some questions. And a huge shout out to our camera classrooms. We'll visit a few classrooms uh, as well, and they can ask their event or their questions live during the event. So one more thing I'd like to do today, I'm gonna share my screen shortly and give you a little taste of how you can visit the Science Literacy website and see how you can participate uh, in some of the events that are coming up. All right, so you should see my screen sharing now. So first of all, on the website, uh, click the event section. And there you can see all the events that are taking place across Canada. You can use filters to find events that interest you. And this year, especially, there's many events held online, just like the one we're doing today. So making them available to everybody across the country. Another section to check out on the website, we always love to give a big shout out to all of our partner groups who've come together to offer all these amazing activities. So thank you for making Science Literacy Week possible and for sharing your love of science. And finally, one more section on the website to highlight is the poster section. So in this section, you can download for free this year's posters on biodiversity, collect the six unique posters to learn more about the Arctic tundra, the prairies, and more Canadian biomes. It's as simple as clicking download the posters. All right, let's come back from that screen share. It is time for the main event. So everyone, please join me in welcoming our special guest. Dr. Johnson is an associate professor at the University of Toronto, Mississauga. He's also the Canadian Research Chair for Urban Environmental Science and the Director uh, for the Center of Urban Environments. Mark is gonna be joined today by his daughter, May. May is a grade 10 student. She's a junior leader for the Riverwood Junior Naturalist Club and conducts some of her own experiments on biodiversity. Mark and May, so great to have you joining us live today. Thanks so much for having us, Joe, and, and hello to everyone across Canada. All right, excellent. Well, let's get right into it. We're gonna do a little interview before we dive into a little Q&A. So Mark, you're a biologist. You've spent your professional life studying species and their interactions. Why did you choose to do that? What made you wanna learn more about the biodiversity that surrounds us? For me, it started very young. So my grandmother had a house at the very tip of Presque Isle Provincial Park, which is a provincial park in Ontario on the North Shore of Lake Ontario. And that, I would go there many times during the summer and through the year on weekends. And they had a nature museum right by her house, just on the other side of the woods. And I'd go into that museum every single day and I just became captivated and fascinated by all of the organisms and plants that they had in there and learning from the naturalists that were working there. I, very early on, I decided that's what I wanted to do. I wanted to be a naturalist. And I became a naturalist in Algonquin Provincial Park. And then later on, I, I realized what I really wanted to do was make discoveries of my own by doing my own scientific research on biodiversity. And that path has led me here, being a professor of biology at University of Toronto, Mississauga. And it is the, I'm living the dream. It's probably the best job I, I could have. I can still go out and catch butterflies and frogs and look at plants and all those things. And so it's, it's a wonderful, uh, wonderful time to be a scientist. All right, awesome. And I think you highlighted an, uh, just an excellent point there is if you can find a career that you love that doesn't feel like work, that's your passion, it's, it's pretty awesome to be able to do that for your whole working life. That's the secret to life. All right, May, we're coming your way. So this spring, you and your family produced a YouTube series called Biology in Your Backyard, where you conducted experiments, explored the biodiversity that lives around us. What would you say is one of the most fantastic things you've seen in your backyard? I would have to go with two because I just can't pick one. Uh, the first one would be a turkey that actually came through in the spring. We have a picture of it here. Uh, and so it was huge and just an incredible bird. And then the second one was a coyote that I actually saw from my bedroom window, kind of digging in the ditch. And when I took a closer look, I realized that it was actually digging up a cache 
that it had hidden before and it seemed to be eating a rabbit. So that was pretty cool as well. All right, very cool. So I have a little link shared at the bottom. It's a YouTube link. If any of the classrooms tuning in would like to check out uh, that channel, it is there. I can pop it up towards the end uh, of the event as well. Okay. So Mark, coming back your way, 82% of Canadians live in urban areas. In your opinion, what is one of the biggest challenges our ecosystems face with urbanization? Right. Well, I think that is a huge challenge. Um, more and more Canadians and people around the world are living in cities and we're dramatically changing the, the environment as we know it. And the biggest challenge is trying to figure out, given that so many people are now living in cities and given that cities have continued to grow, how can we have less of an impact on the environment? How can we keep the environment healthy as more people live in Canadian and cities around the world? And associated with that, that will have positive consequences if we can figure out how to do that on human health as well, because it'll influence the quality of the air we breathe, the quality of the water that we drink, and the quality of the environment that we're living on in the soil and the terrestrial environments. And so this is the real challenge, and, and this is going to be a challenge we need to solve if we want to learn how we can live sustainably on Earth. All right. So kind of building on that a little bit, um, you know, what are some actions students in the classroom or at home or really even the general public can do to help preserve ecosystems in urban areas? Yeah, so I think the, the first thing is to really try and learn about the environment around you and how we're impacting that environment and then learn the actions that you as an individual can take that can reduce your impact on that environment so how can you minimize your footprint on this planet and maybe that means that you'll have to change some of your own behaviors maybe you turn off more of your lights maybe you recycle so, um, some of your your items instead of putting them in the garbage um, maybe that means not taking the car every single time and riding a bike or public transit. And so I think we really need to think about how can we as individuals reduce our impact and collectively we'll be able to have a huge change in making this a healthier environment and planet to live on. All right, let's bring May back in. We've got a question here for both of you. What advice would you give to young students like the ones joining us today that are interested in biodiversity and would like to keep learning more about it? I would say that probably the most important thing and also probably one of the easiest things to do is just getting outside. Uh, it can be as simple as just exploring the area around your apartment building, your townhouse, your house, your backyard, as we showed in our YouTube channel. And also it can be as simple as just flipping over logs and flipping over rocks and seeing what you can find there. I, I completely agree with May. I think that's the first recipe to what, what students can do that are watching today. I, but I think there's two more things that they can do as well. I think the second thing they can do is when they're getting outside, then learn about what they're seeing. So when they flip over those logs or those rocks and they see a centipede under there, what is that? Is it a centipede? Is it a millipede? What types of worms are living there? Or if you're looking at the birds around you, what types of birds or what types of plants? So learning about what you're seeing in the environment uh, around you. I'd say that's the second thing. And the third thing I'd say is get involved with biodiversity conservation and biodiversity science. And you'd be amazed the number of different projects that even kids as young as kindergarten can get involved with in their own community. So we lead the Riverwood Junior Naturalist Club here in Mississauga, Ontario, Canada. And one of the things we do every year is get the kids involved with citizen science, studying the, the, the migration of monarch butterflies. And monarch butterflies, many of the students will know, have this spectacular migration. At this time of year, right now as I'm talking, there are millions and millions of monarchs moving from Canada to their wintering grounds in the mountains northwest of Mexico City. It's a huge flight. But to study that migration, to understand how they make it down, and because it's an endangered species, to understand the threats that are facing these species, we need to, to be able to identify individuals to figure out where they're they're going from and to and, and how many are surviving. So I think we have a we shot a little video this week actually of some of the monarchs that we've been studying 
with this citizen science project called Monarch Watch. And so, Joe, if you wouldn't mind uh, sharing that video, this was taken just this week. So right now we're on the University of Toronto Mississauga campus and look at all the monarch butterflies. They're all over this butterfly bush. Now let's look in close. Oh wow, you can see this one and we're going to collect this one so that we can tag it so we can study its migration to Mexico. I'll catch it. Okay, I have the monarch butterfly and now I'm going to tag it. First thing I do is I sex the butterfly. And I do that by opening the wings, and you'll notice that this one is a male. And the way I know that is because you see these two black dots here on the hind wings. Those are glands, and only males have them. So if it's a female, it won't have those glands there. So now, once I've closed up the wings, you notice that I've put a tag here on the mitten-shaped cell of the butterfly's wing. And I'll just show you the other side here. So that's that cell. You put it right in the middle of the cell shaped like a mitten. And um, when I put the tag on, I will squeeze it for five seconds, which I've already done. And then I release the monarch butterfly. So these, these tags, if you look closely, had a little letter number code and a website. And so if an individual anywhere between here and Mexico sees one of those monarchs with a tag, they can record that, visit the website and say, hey, I saw this monarch with a tag and it had this letter number code and report it. And then they can learn, hey, that one started in Mississauga, Ontario when it was tagged. And this is where they made it to. And by doing this research, which was started right here in Canada by Professor Fred Urquhart at University of Toronto, Scarborough, we were able to figure out where monarchs were going. We didn't originally know they were going to these mountains in Mexico. We we're able to figure out where they were going. And now today that we know where they're going, we're figuring out ways that we can conserve this endangered species more effectively. And all of you can get involved with this project if you visit monarchwatch.org and you can actually order one of these kits and you too can tag uh, these monarch butterflies. All right, very cool. Well, I love those three uh, points you gave us, uh, especially, you know, just getting out and turning over logs. I can remember growing up and even taking my son Finn now, he's, he's turning eight soon, out and turning over logs and always getting pretty darn excited. It's salamander underneath was always a big score. So yeah, it's great to get outside and, uh, and connect with nature that way. So we've got a first question here that came in uh, from online, wondering about the, the tag. Does it damage or hurt the, the monarch's wing in any way? No, it doesn't damage or, or harm the, the butterfly in any way. They're very, very light tags. They're at the base of the wing. And so they don't impede the flight of the, the butterfly at all. And in fact, they find thousands of these butterflies with these tags in Mexico every single winter. And the longest, uh, the record for the longest flight by a monarch butterfly was tagged by an individual by the name of Don Davis here in Ontario, Canada, where he tagged it here and it made it all the way to Mexico and all the way back to Texas the following spring, showing that these things can do very well with these little tags. All right, very cool. Well, it's time to get interactive. So those who are tuning in live via YouTube and Facebook, especially the classroom groups, uh, start sending in some questions for us now. We're gonna start visiting our live camera classrooms as well and taking some of their classrooms. And then I'm gonna give just a couple shout outs here to some groups who I knew or know are tuning in with us right now. We've got some grade three fours hanging out with us in Vancouver, British Columbia. We've got another class hanging out with us in Alberta, Calgary. Shout out to Kingston, Ontario, fourth and fifth graders hanging out with us. And then another shout out here to Georgetown, Ontario, grade sixes. So that's just a little kind of taste of some of the groups who are joining us live right now. Uh, let's start getting some of those questions coming in. All right, so we're gonna visit our first live classroom. We're gonna start off by going to Mrs. Dion's group. They're sixth graders, they're hanging out with us in Ontario. I'm gonna pop them out from backstage, turn on the mic. Hey, grade sixes, how you doing today? Hi. Yep. We're ready with the question. Can you hear us? We, we hear you, we're ready. We're looking forward to it. Okay, go ahead, Clark. 
Um, how fast can monarch butterflies fly? Ooh, that's a great question. How fast can they fly? Um, I, I don't know the exact kilometers per hour, but they can certainly make it um, about 200 kilometers a day would be a, a big flight for a monarch in one day. And so they're doing that. And usually it'll actually be shorter than that. And so they're doing this in a series of flights, but one flight as they're going south all the way to Mexico will take them several weeks to months. But then when they're coming back north, they're actually not one big flight. It's actually a series of four generations. So the first generation makes it to Texas. Then the next generation makes it up to about Tennessee and North Carolina. The next generation makes it to Ohio and Pennsylvania. And then it's the fourth generation in the spring to early summer that makes it into Canada. But we should get out a radar gun and, and uh, try and get the maximum speed. That would be fun. All right. Very, very cool. Um, you know, it's, it's, uh, they look so small and delicate, but it's amazing the distance they can travel and, and what they can do. So it's pretty, pretty amazing. Uh, all right, Mr. Yon's class, we will come back your way for another question shortly, but let's grab another one from online. So we've got Karen joining us in Vancouver and they're curious, little biodiversity question. They're seeing a lot of moths right now at this time of year. Is there any reason why you can think uh, that might be? Well, different insects have come out at different times of years. So some specialize in coming out in the spring, some in the middle of summer, and then some come out in uh, in the fall and right into the winter. And some actually are most active in the winter. And so we have a, a moth here called the, the winter span worm that is only active as adults at this time of year in the fall into the early winter. They lay their, they mate at this time of year and they lay eggs not being in Vancouver right now, I can't tell you what moth that is, but it'll be one of these late flying moth species that come out late in the summer and early in the fall. All right, very cool. Let's head over, we'll bring another one of our live classrooms into the call. Miss Rigo's joining us, grade six, seven's hanging out in Toronto, Ontario. Let's bring them out from backstage. There we go. Our live classroom. Hey boys and girls, how you doing? Hi, um, so our question is, uh, how does each generation of monarch butterflies know which direction to fly in to continue the journey? Right, it's a great question. So they can use both um, the direction of the sun and also the magnetic fields from the poles to determine the direction that they're moving at that time of year. So they're, they're like a, a little living compass as they fly south and then again north always knowing whether to point their, their their heads and fly south or to point them north, depending on the time of year. All right, great question. We'll come back uh, to your class again shortly, Miss Rigo. But you can definitely see that that tagging video has spawned a lot of curiosity uh, and questions uh, from our audience. In fact, we have another one here um, wondering about how big of a group do they travel in together? So are they solitary? Do they gather somewhere before kind of heading out? What's her? Well, I'm going to, I'm going to push this over to May and, and ask her what she's seen when we've been out. Like, so what do you, do you see in groups or individuals? Uh, generally they're individuals. Uh, if there is like a lot of flowers, then there'll be lots of monarchs nectaring on those flowers. But I wouldn't necessarily say that they would travel in groups. The, the only time that you will see them in a group is at night. And then they'll they'll roost together on the the boughs of branches, and you'll get a, a number clustering together at that time, uh, but not when they're flying and migrating. But then, if I can just add, Joe, briefly, if you go down to Mexico where they're overwintering, you have millions and millions of monarchs draped all over the conifer trees in those mountains where they're spending the winter at cool temperatures. It I've never seen it myself. I've seen lots of photos and it's an impressive sight. Oh, absolutely. You see some amazing, uh, you know, Planet Earth comes to mind where they've done some uh, with the BBC, where they've done some some footage there. But I guess that kind of brings another question, kind of highlighting the, the conservation issues around, you know, species like monarchs. They're, they cover large distances. They have their their winter grounds, their their summer grounds. Can you talk a little bit about the challenges that that come with that? 
Yeah, so there's huge challenges for the, these species. You know, as you suggest, they're moving a lot over large distances. Anything that migrates, that's a very risky behavior. There's a lot of challenges that you face while you're moving such long distances. So they could be eaten potentially by the, a bird, even though they're slightly poisonous. There are things that will try to eat them. Um, when they're in their summering grounds and trying to reproduce, things like pesticides that are being sprayed on crops um, or even in people's yards can be absolutely devastating for these insects. And then when they, they go south and overwinter in Mexico, they're in a very confined area. There's only a few locations where they overwinter. And as a result of that, any uh, thing that you do to the forest there, so if there's deforestation or if they have a particularly hard winter, it can wipe out a huge proportion of the population. So both in the wintering grounds, um, but also during migration and in the summering grounds, they are encountering threats that we have to be aware of and try to mitigate those threats in order to save species like the monarch butterfly. All right, absolutely. Let's bring in our next classroom joining us live. Mr. Mundy's class is in Bowmanville. Let me get their microphone turned on. How are we doing today, Bowmanville? Hello. Hi. You're quiet today. That's okay. Who's got a question for us? I think the question was already asked, and that was how long it took them to get down to Mexico, and that was answered on the four generations. One generation to get down, four generations to get back. Get back. Yeah. All right. Very cool. We'll come back your way uh, a little. Oh, sorry. Go ahead, Mr. Mundy. Is, is there an idea of how many monarchs are there in North America? There are, I can't pull a number for you off the top of my head. There are estimates of how many are overwintering in Mexico for sure. There's also wintering grounds on the west coast of California, much smaller. And that's a, a different subpopulation, the western population of monarch butterflies that don't go all the way to Mexico. They do migrate, but much shorter distances. And they, they overwinter in a few small uh, locations, but the vast majority of species that live in Canada and certainly everything that we see east of the Rockies is, co is coming from Mexico. All right, great question. So May, I wanna put a question your way. Um, you know, you've grown up uh, around science and getting outside and exploring. What are you thinking about doing uh, after high school? Do you have an idea? Um that's a tough question, I I have to say. Uh, I am really passionate about plants and I really enjoy looking at plants and especially growing plants. I have like a little garden going on in my window. Um, but I don't think I would pursue it uh, necessarily as a career at this point. So I'm looking mostly for something in teaching. Yeah, possibly involving French. All right, very cool. So Mark, I wanna dive a little bit deeper into you know, some of your research and, and where it's taken you. So you look at relationships between plants and animals. Uh, you look at how that maybe shapes evolution, how they change over time. Um, and it looks like that you, you know, you've been down and been able to do some work in the Galapagos. Mm -hmm. uh, can you tell, you know, those tuning in, uh, I had the pleasure of visiting in 2016. Can you tell them a little bit about what it's like to be somewhere in the field in a place like the Galapagos? It's amazing. You know, it's you're, It's almost like living on a different planet at times, getting to explore environments and diversity that you have never seen in the place where you usually live, wherever you are in Canada right now. And so we do a lot of work on the Galapagos Islands. In fact, May and came with me for three months in 2018 to do some of this work. And the work that we're doing is trying to understand the ecology, so the interactions and the evolution of, of those interactions between Darwin's finches, which are a relatively small bird that mostly eats seeds, and the plants that they eat. And so we're trying to understand how the plants can evolve ways to protect themselves against these birds that are constantly trying to eat their seeds. And this is vital for the, the survival of, of these birds. At the same time, because there's more and more tourists from uh, going to the Galapagos, we're also trying to understand how humans that live on the Galapagos or visit the Galapagos are changing these interactions and the evolution. And when you go to a place like like the Galapagos, um, you know, you see organisms that 
you can behave very differently. So how often do you get to go up to a bird and get to have it right by your hand or actually get it flying on your head? And that happens in the Galapagos almost daily. The first day we had breakfast, all of a sudden these Darwin's finches just started flocking in because they thought they could get a free meal off our plates. And we didn't allow, allow them to do that, but sometimes they could sneak in there and get a little morsel. <laughs> all right, I know what you're saying. I was on the ground taking some pictures of a giant tortoise and I had to roll out of the way eventually so I wouldn't be run over in slow motion. It just didn't care that I was there at all. Yeah. Very cool. All right, well, let's take another swing through our live classrooms. We'll take a couple more from online as well, but let's head back to our great sixes with Miss Dion and see if they have another question for us. You're on. You are on. Okay. Okay, honey, it's right here. You can read it. Um, right there. How much? How much? So I don't know if you can hear Julian or not, but he was asking, how many plants can a butterfly pollinate in a day? That's a great question, Julian, and thank you for that question. Uh, so butterflies will tend to be what we refer to as generalist. So they don't specialize most often on one particular plant. They can visit a lot of different plants. And so at this time of year, when we're out looking at butterflies, which we do almost every single weekend, a butterfly like the monarch butterfly, we'll see on goldenrod, and then we'll see on butterfly bush, which we, we showed in, in that uh, video right there. And then we'll see it on New England aster, and then lance leaved aster, and then heath aster. They'll visit anything that has nectar because that's what they need to power their body to fly to Mexico. They need sugar, just like your body needs carbohydrates that you get from the different foods that you eat. The, these these uh, butterflies get all of their food from the sugar from the nectar. And so as many plant species as are flowering that have nectar, they'll be drinking from them. And as they go along, they'll be pollinating them as they pick up pollen on one flower and bring it to another flower of the same species. So it would be quite conceivable for them to visit 10, 20, maybe even 30 species in a day as they're going around nectaring. All right, we've got a great question coming in online here. And this question, if you know someone, say they're in Vancouver or Toronto or uh, you know Alberta, what can what would you recommend people do if they want to learn more about the species they can find in their area? To learn more about the species in their area, I think uh, May gave one of the the uh, best pieces of advice is to first of all get outside and just see what you're seeing around you. But then you have this trick of, okay, how do I identify those things? And there are a number of different identification guides that you can use to help you identify what you're seeing. So some of these may be um, specific to all of Canada, and we'll actually share some of these books with you shortly. Some of them may be specific to the province you're in, British Columbia, Alberta, Ontario, and some of them may even be specific to the city you're in. So for example, if you're really into mammals, the Toronto Field Naturalist and the, the, um, the City of Toronto produced Mammals of Toronto, where you can actually get this guide and see all the different mammals that occur in the city, like the mink, which you rarely see, but are actually super common. Or there may even be a guide specific to the park that you love to go to. So one of our favorite places is Riverwood and the Riverwood Conservancy produced the wildflowers of Riverwood. And so in here is the most common wildflower species that you'll see inside that park. And so using those types of publications is the best way to, um, to identify these things. But now there's increasing um, resources that are on as apps on phones. So for example, if you just bear with me for a second, one of the best ones right now is called iNaturalist. And let's see if you can see the little icon right there. And if you go into iNaturalist, you can actually take a picture of something. Now, in this case, it's May, but we could take a picture of any organism and they have was called machine learning al algorithms that have been developed through science and math and, and computational sciences 
to identify what they are. And they're right about 95% of the time. So it's an amazing resource that you can use as well. All right. I see a few in the chat saying that they use it as well. Uh, yeah, iNaturalist is super cool. And I'll use this as a moment just to tell uh, those classrooms who are tuning in, we're doing a, uh, we call it backyard bio right now for the month of September. So we're encouraging students to get outside, uh, take pictures of what they find in their communities, load them to our project page on iNaturalist. And then we're pairing classrooms up with other classrooms from different locations to share what they're finding and present to each other. Fantastic. So, yeah, I'll pop a little banner here at the bottom. So backyardbio.net for any uh, students or really the general public if you want to get involved with our September activities. Very cool. All right, let's visit Miss Regal's class again. Let's pop them back into the stream. There they are. Involved with our September activities. Very cool. All right, let's visit Miss Regal's class. All right, hello again. Um, Hi. We had another question from another student. Um, she wants to know, what is the wingspan of a monarch butterfly? Ooh, that's a great question. Uh, I wish I had my ruler here. Uh, and to be honest, we actually tried to catch a butterfly, a monarch butterfly for you for this episode, but it was just a little cool last night. And so there weren't many that were flying today. But the I'm going to have to approximate the, the, the length. It's going to be about, the wingspan will be about 15 centimeters. So half of your 30 centimeter um, uh, ruler that you'll typically be using at the school. But you could actually answer that question yourself. If you go and catch a monarch butterfly, and if you wouldn't mind getting one of the nets there. Sure. So we'll show you the type of net that you can actually use to catch these. And these are relatively easy to find online. So the ones that you get at the dollar stores are not very uh, effective at catching butterflies. You need something with a deeper pocket like this one. And so with this, you can, if you swing at the, the monarch butterfly and you turn it over, you can get it caught in the, in the bottom here, reach in, take it out, and their scales are actually very hard. So they don't come off very easily, unlike most moths and butterflies. And then you can use your ruler and figure out exactly what their, their wingspan is. So that's my challenge to the student that, that answered or asked that question. Go and see if you can actually measure that on the next uh, monarch butterfly you see. All right, great. Let's pop back into Mr. Mundy's group and see if they if they have a, a follow up with us. Yeah. Hello. Um, the question was generation. How long is one generation for a butterfly? That's a great question. Again, uh, these. Butterflies vary in how long their generations are. Uh, so a monarch butterfly can vary from being a month to six weeks to as long as uh, 10 or nine months, depending on when it's born during the year. So the ones that are being born right now, these are the ones that are going to live, that are going to overwinter in Mexico and then come back in February and March. So those ones are, are living for not quite a year, but um, multiple months. There's others that only come out like the Eastern tail blue, which is a small little blue butterfly uh, that only come out for a few weeks. So they emerge as an adult, they quickly uh, nectar, mate, lay eggs, and then they die just one or two weeks later. And then those eggs hatch feed on the local plants, the clovers and the other plants in the bean family for that, that species. And then they'll emerge as adults as well. So for those ones, it's not gonna be much longer than eight weeks for their lifespan. And then there's another one that I actually just saw today when I was looking for monarch butterflies called a morning cloak. And these are an amazing species. They overwinter as adults. So many will overwinter as eggs, larvae or pupa, different life stages. Very few overwinter as adults, but this morning cloak butterfly will actually find a little dark, quiet spot inside of a tree or underneath some tree bark, and it'll spend the entire winter there as an adult. And so it will live for quite some time, maybe as long as eight months if it's being born in August and then uh, continuing through to the spring. All right. Well, Mark, I want to throw one more question at you, and this is about... Uh, just biodiversity in general. So 
you know, why is biodiversity so important to the health of an ecosystem? Right. So ecosystems are based on interactions. They're interactions between species and the environment that they're living within. And so those interactions are what sustain the health of an environment. So the, the quality of the water or the presence of top predators and many of these things people will eat, such as fish or different plant species. I love blueberries, for example, or strawberries. Um, all of these things depend on these interactions and biodiversity. And so without that biodiversity, we can't sustain these e ecosystems for the food that we eat, but also the health of other organisms like those pollinators we've been talking about, um, the, the microbes that are in the soil, they're all interconnected in these ways. And if you knock out some of these species, which is what's been happening in urban environments and with global climate change and in general disturbance caused by humans, then this can disrupt these ecosystems. And if you knock out enough of those species, the entire ecosystem can collapse. So species will start to go extinct um, and uh, people uh, can no longer live there or be able to um, sustain harvests of certain species. And so we see this happening in certain places in the world, particularly on, on islands or in uh, very fra fragile ecosystems. But it could potentially happen in, eco in any ecosystem if we're not careful. All right. So uh, first of all, I want to say a huge thank you to all the, the groups who are joining us and sending in the great questions. They've been awesome. But before we go, there's another important date to add to your calendar. Wednesday, September 23rd, we'll be celebrating National Science Reading Day. So to celebrate, dedicate a period of your day to read about science, visit your local library, or pick up a science book on a topic that interests you, and maybe you want to know a little bit more about. So with that in mind, Mark and May, do you have a favorite book or a book suggestion that you'd like to share with us? Yeah, I think May is going to start here. And I think one of the the uh, listeners already asked a question that kind of highlights some of the books that we like. When I was a kid, I really wanted to understand what was around me, what I was seeing. And so the books that I was most attracted to when I was growing up were things that would help me identify some um, type of organism. And May has one of her favorite books here. Uh, so this was like probably one of the first ones that I really sciencey books that I started reading. Uh, it's called Trees in Canada. It's a very easy kind of guide to follow uh, because you'll see, I don't know if you can see this, but the groups and so the identifications are just divided by leaf type. And so you can actually look at the tree and then say, oh, this looks like this leaf type and then go to that section of the book. So if you're interested in trees, this has every single tree species that you can find in Canada. So this is the definitive resource. Similarly, one that we use because we like butterflies a lot is Butterflies of Canada. And so this is another one from coast to coast to coast you can use to identify any butterfly that you see. But maybe you spend most of your time in Toronto. So we talked about uh, that the Toronto series produced by the, the Toronto Field Naturalists and the City of Toronto. But they didn't just produce one on mammals. They produced one on reptiles and amphibians on mushrooms and a whole host of other things. So if you can get your hands on these great resources, and then perhaps you're more interested in actually learning about those interactions. And then one of our favorite books is Monarchs and Milkweeds by Professor Anurag Agarwal, who was a professor originally at University of Toronto. He's now moved to Cornell University in New York. But this tells a lot about the story that he started studying here in Ontario of the interactions between milkweeds and monarchs, another fantastic book. So I know you asked for one, but there's a whole bunch. All right, no, the more the merrier. Great suggestions, awesome. Uh, okay, well, Mark, May, thank you so much for joining uh, us today. Thank you for those awesome uh, book suggestions. And uh, yeah, thank you for taking us a little bit into your world, Mark, that you study. But May, thank you so much for taking us into some of your adventures and the tagging of the monarchs, as you can see, uh, that really hooked our audience today, and they just wanted to know more and more about the monarchs, probably because they're seeing them a lot more at the time of the, the, the season. Well, thank you, Joe, and thanks to all the kids and teachers that joined us today. Uh, we hope that you can get outside and learn more about biodiversity in your own backyard. 
All right. Well, again, thank you everybody for tuning in. Facebook, YouTube, thank you so much to our live classrooms. That's the time that we have for today's event. Thank you to all of those who tuned in and don't forget to participate in Science Literacy Week from September 21st to the 27th, 2020. Once again, thanks everybody. And we are ending for today.